Hi, everybody. Um, Tim Flagler here doing um, a live video for Fly Tire Magazine. Uh, you got to bear with me a little bit. This is my first uh, video with Fly Tire, uh, uh, first online video anyway, um, really first online video of any kind. Uh, so we're just kind of going to get some of the bugs worked out and see where we land. Um, anyway, the fly I want to tie for you here tonight is a squirrel and hurl bugger. Um, uh, many of you guys have seen me tie this before on videos and at tying events. Uh, the reason I chose it is it's got a lot of like really good lessons in it, um, techniques and stuff like that. It's a fairly simple tie, uh, but above and beyond everything else, it's a really, really good little streamer pattern. It's basically uh, replaced the olive woolly bugger for me. Um, uh, in terms of fishing. And one of the things that really makes it, it it's kind of like halfway between a uh, woolly bugger and say a zonker. And pine squirrel is just a remarkable material. It's got a much thinner, uh, smaller hide than rabbit does. The fur is actually much smaller, shorter uh, than, than rabbit. But to me, the really cool thing are these fine dark markings on it that just it looks like, uh, you know, a bait fish or for, or even an insect. Uh, all those things have fine, dark markings like that. So really cool material. Um, it used to be fairly cheap. And then some YouTube guy started doing videos extolling its virtues. And uh, the stuff got a little more expensive. I don't know who that was. Anyway, so uh, let's get started. Uh, hopefully everybody's there. Um, and can see what's going on. Let us know if there are any audio or video problems along the way. Yeah, take this one out of the vise. And for a hook, um, what I'm using here is a, uh, this is actually a lightning strike SN3 in size 10. Uh, it's about the same as a Dairiki number 710 um, in size 10. Their shape's a little different, but pretty similar. Um, any 3X long streamer hook will work just fine. Sixes, eights, tens, twelves. I wouldn't go much smaller than a, uh, than a 12, really. But uh, 3X seems to be just, just about right for, for getting the proportions right. You don't want it too short, like 2X is too short. Uh, 4X, it gets a little wonky. Um, it's hard to keep a fish on with, with 4X uh, long hook, for me anyway. So for thread, I'm, gonna, I'm using uh, UTC 140 denier in olive. Um, I'd recommend uh, going with, with a, a slightly larger thread. There's no reason to go small like 70 denier or 8 aught on this one. Uh, you're not really worried about bulk or anything like that. Um, and the fact of the matter is, when, when you're tying anything, whether it's rabbit or pine squirrel that has that leather strip, you, you really want to put some thread tension on it, and having the 140 helps in that regard. Now, with, with this fly, there's a lot that gets tied in right at the head of the fly. And so we, we do want to keep some room uh, right up by the eye. So I'm going to get my thread started, leave about an eye length space behind the eye, and I, I just want to try to keep that throughout the tying procedure, kind of till the very end. So snip that excess tag off. And I'm just going to keep on taking wraps rearward just to kind of build up a thread base. Right to about the start of the hook bend, which is generally somewhere about halfway between the, the hook point and the barb. So right in there somewhere. All right, with the pine squirrel, uh, I'm, I am I won't say I'm a pine squirrel hoarder, but I'm, I'm pretty close. Um, I just really like this stuff. And, and one of the things that I do with this pattern is, is I have one of these pine squirrel strips that comes from the zonked pine squirrel, one of these guys. I'm going to zoom out just a little bit so you can see what that looks like. Um, so I, I really don't even want to waste a millimeter of this stuff if I can. 
And so what I'm going to do is take one of those strips that I snipped off. And you want the, the, the fur canted backwards like that, back toward the back of the fly. And I'm going to measure to form a tail. It's going to hang off the back. That I'm measuring the leather part, and I want it to be a full shank in length. So that little tip is right back there. Then I'm going to go behind the hook eye. And with this stuff, just wetting your fingertips just a little bit makes it way, way, way more manageable. And when you're tying this stuff in, I'd recommend giving your bobbin a clockwise spin. And what I mean by that is if you're looking down on your bobbin, you want it to spin clockwise. Okay. What that's going to do is it's going to cord up your thread and make it uh, stronger and thinner. And so when I take a wrap with that corded up thread, it's really going to dig in. You can see why I wanted heavier thread too. Really dig into that pine squirrel. I'm going to take two wraps around there. And a little trick that I do whenever I'm tying in stuff like this, then I'll take two wraps around just the hook shank. And then follow that with two more around the material. And what I found is... That, that generally makes, makes it so that material doesn't want to spin so bad around the hook shank. Just locks it in there nice. Yeah. What, what's the question, Joan? Um, got a question from Rick, and it's, will olive rabbit fur strips work? You, you can make it work on bigger, uh, say, sixes and fours, but it's the, the fur is awful long on rabbit. It's almost double the length of the fur on uh, that the pine squirrel has, and you also have a much, much larger leather strip that holds that fur together. And so that, that leather strip also tends to soak up water, um, and so they, they get kind of nasty to cast. It really is a very, very different fly when you tie it with rabbit. Uh, just think bigger. Anyway, um, so we, we got the pine squirrel tied in. And pine squirrel, like I said, is just a fabulous material. Um, another one of my favorite materials is just plain old peacock curl. Um, strung peacock curl. Uh, this is nice, nice, long, fluffy stuff. And <clears throat> there, there are many different ways that you can put in peacock curl on a fly. Uh, everybody seems to have their own, own little technique. I, I'm only going to take three strands of this stuff. And what I'm going to do is I have all the tips together like this. And I'm going to snip off, I don't know, maybe about an inch of those tips. Get that out of the way. I'm not really worried about the taper, the body here. It, everything kind of gets covered up. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to just tie in the tips of that peacock curl right back there. Get that anchored really well right at the base of the pine squirrel. So I have three strips out or three hurls out like that. The way I tie this in is a little different than most people. I like to leave my thread right there. And so when I'm wrapping with the hurl, I basically have to push up on the thread with those hurls each time. You have to be a little careful in here by the hook point. You don't want to hit one of those hurls and break it. But you can see I'm pushing up on that, that tying thread. And what that does is it, it tends to sandwich those hurls together as you work your way up the shank. And so you don't get one that wants to run ahead on you. The other little tip I can give you, and I don't even know why this really works, is when you're wrapping, when you get out beyond the hook point anyway, is rather than wrapping at 90 degrees, kind of like that, start angling your wraps a little bit. And it tends to make a fluffier little body on the fly. Don't really know why, <clears throat> why that is, but... So I'm going to wrap all the way up with those hurls. I'm going to maintain that space. B. 
behind the hook guy. Just anchor it with like three good tight turns. You could break that stuff off. I'm doing this live, so I'm not going to do that. I'm going to just snip it off. Anyway, beautiful little, little, you know, nice fluffy peacock curl body. Love the iridescence of that stuff. Um, really is just, it, it works on any fly that you put it on. I mean, think of how many great fly patterns we have that have peacock curl in them. It's uh, really one of those magical materials. So for the hackle, um, again, I, I'm a little different, um, and I do this on my woolly buggers as well. Um, I, I kind of hackle backwards from what most people do. And for hackle, for a long time, it was really, really tough getting decent hackles for woolly buggers. You, you had like dry fly hackle, which doesn't really work very well. And then you had big saddle hackles, kind of for saltwater flies, which just make the, the fibers were just too long on most of them. And if you sorted through like a, a pack of strung saddle hackles, you get one or two that had fibers that were the correct length. Um, and what I mean by the correct length is, you, for me anyway, what I like is fibers that are about a hook shank. I hope you can see that. About a hook shank in length. That one's pretty darn good. So nowadays you can get... Um, there are a couple different options. Whiting Farms makes a uh, Whiting Farms bugger pack. One of these guys. Sorry, that's a little... We'll zoom out. Um, again, somebody on YouTube started talking about how great they were and the price went up and they got hard to get. But a very good value for the money, I really and truly. Um, generally, they have three different size little, like, kind of half necks in a pack, one large, one medium, one small, so you can use them for different size buggers or squirrel and hurls or whatever you want. The other option is now um, you can get these nice saddle hackles, like a, a Ewing one, uh, really, really long. You get multiple buggers out of, out of one feather. Um, my buddy Evan Brandt out at Sidling Hill Hackle is also – he, he dyed this one for me, and uh, absolutely, it's like the perfect color olive and grizzly for me, and just a ton of really nice long feathers. Uh, most of them have short, fairly short fibers on them. You can see there, uh, all these are just perfect for doing these things. Uh, so, to, like a lifetime supply of feathers, um, and the the dye job was so so good on it uh when i got it from him i i basically had to rip it out of his hands i don't think he wanted to let it go but um that's what i'll be using i'm going to be using one of evan's hackles here today tonight and so the way to to prep these things is you can see the nasty fluffy fuzzy thick stem stuff down here i have plenty of feather um really really long nice feather and again the the fibers are about the right size and so I'm going to go in here, I don't know, I, I guess to right about there, the stem sort of uh, drops down in size pretty good right there. And I'm going to use my vise or my hook kind of as a, as a hand brace. And that way, hopefully I can do this without shaking too bad. I'm going to cut out a nice little triangular tie-in anchor. You can see it there. And just to make sure that this sucker wraps absolutely the way I want it to, I'm going to strip a couple of fibers from the top edge. Now, I have the front side, the shiny side of the feather facing me when I do that. Okay, that's the back side, dull side, and that's the front side. So that tie-in anchor is really, really important. If I was just tying in that slippery stem on that slippery hook shank, that bare hook shank, that stem would have a real tendency to pull out when I go to wrap it. And I really don't want to have that happen. Um, another little trick for you guys, if and you've seen me do this countless times on the videos, if my thread was really spun up like this, if I want to grab that hackle, a lot of times it wants to jump forward. And I just about lost my peacock curl there. That was almost a disaster. 
Anyway, if you go like this, spin your bobbin counterclockwise, and you'll really see it when I take this first strap of thread, your thread's going to want to jump rearward and catch that material. Real handy when you're tying in something just by the, the, the butt end. Okay. I'm going to zoom in just a little bit for this next part. So you can see what's going on. Everybody okay out there? Just reading some of the comments. Great. All very good. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to bend this forward. This is where the whole tying sequence just gets a little wonky as compared to what most people do. And I'm going to take my tying thread. You can see it's it's flattened and very flossy looking. I'm going to, again, spin my bobbin clockwise, really cord it up, make it super thin and strong. And then I'm going to run it back through my peacock curl. And what I'm doing is since I wrap the peacock curl this way, going up the body, when I'm wrapping the the thread going back this way, I'm cross wrapping all that delicate peacock curl. So that stuff, you know, a trout tooth, if it gets in there, is not going to, it might break the peacock curl, but it's not going to all come unwound. And the, the fact of the matter is you, you can see the thread through there a little bit, but it, it's, it's, you know, the peacock curl isn't too matted down or anything terrible like that. So, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my feather. I'm going to start making wraps. But real important here, guys, do two to three flat wraps, one right behind the other, before you start angling rearward. And the reason is, is if you just went straight and angled, started taking angled wraps immediately, you, you've made what amounts to a corkscrew. And so if you're fishing and, you know, pulling that, this streamer through the water, it's going to corkscrew and it has a real tendency to spin up a uh, finer tippet. Um, so a couple of flat wraps sort of block that spinning motion. And then I can start making open spiral wraps rearward all the way back to the base of the tail. Okay. And I'm going to get that anchor down there real, real well. Um, it would probably be safest to use my tying scissors to snip that off, but I'm, I'm kind of feeling brave. I'm going to work the feather in a little bit and then just pull straight forward and break it off. So a nice looking kind of mottled grizzly olive uh, woolly bugger body going. Now, once again, I'm going to take my tying thread, I'm going to cord it up, make it nice and thin, and then I'm going to work my way through that hackle. I don't want to trap it as I'm going up through here. Sometimes it's better just to go fast, other times better to go slow. And land right there, right at the front of all that hackle. Okay, and so what I've done here, I don't know whether you guys realize it or not, but that the hackle was wound back this way, going back around like that. And now I've wound my thread, so I've cross-wrapped that delicate hackle stem. So everything in the body of the fly has been cross-wrapped. And again, even if a trout tooth gets all the way in there, it may break it, but it's not going to come unwound. And I'm, I'm sure you guys have experienced like a, a commercially tied woolly bugger, a, you know, one fish, and you, you have this hackle feather that's hanging off of it, and it's, it's basically unusable. So I'm going to zoom back in a little bit here, guys. I also am going to try to get this tilted up just a little so it looks a little better in my tying vise. Okay. <laughs> yes, John, I would much rather be in Patagonia as well. 
uh, next year. Can't wait. I'm going to do, uh, you younger guys will have no idea what I'm talking about, but, but I'm, I'm going to do, uh, an alfalfa here and kind of preen, preen those fibers down on either side, make a little space for them, and then just pull that pine squirrel up between all the fibers and just wet my fingers just a little bit. Maybe a little bit more fur pulled back. And I'm going to repeat that same tie-in procedure up here. I'm going to give my bobbin a good clockwise spin. Get that thread corded up small and really strong. And just take a couple wraps. And then pull down nice and tight on those wraps. Bring everything back. Hopefully everything. Take a few more around just the shank. And then a couple of more around the material. And now, probably the trickiest part of this whole fly um, is I, I need to snip that, that pine squirrel off and... I don't want to snip the wraps, but the, sh the smaller you can snip that pine squirrel off, uh, the better looking smaller head you can get on the fly. So I just kind of lift up and what I'm going to do is use the hook eye as a guide and I just don't want to snip my tying thread. So get in there, you say a little prayer and then snip. And so I have a little nub in there. That's not too bad. Just going to take my tying thread and carefully from front to back work my way up forward. I might have a little, it might slip down in here, but that's okay. I think I'm doing pretty well. And the thing with producing a, a nice looking head on the, on any fly really, is as soon as it looks good, stop wrapping. Okay. Everybody has a ten. Me, I have the tendency as well. I, I always put like three or four more extra wraps on there, uh, and it just it. The smaller you can keep the head on the fly, the better. I got one little hackle fiber in there now. It's gone. So um, almost there, guys, on this fly. Uh, what's the question? What have we got? <laughs> Hold on. Oh, okay. I got a couple of good questions. We'll we'll get them. <laughs> Thanks, Seth. Um, uh, wait, um, and a really good question. Uh, that's from Todd. And and yes, you you can put weight on these. Um, I actually prefer a bead head as opposed to the wire wraps beneath. The wire wraps beneath. Uh, really require you to have some real long peacock curl. That extra diameter on the hook make, means that you need much longer peacock curl. So something to be aware of there. Uh, pretty much though, I, I try to keep flies like this where I can unweighted. Uh, and you, you need to think of it like this, is those, the bait fish that they're intended to imitate, whether it's a dace or a darter or a sculpin, they're all pretty much neutrally buoyant. Um, they, they just ride in the water just naturally. And so if you add weight to a fly, it just doesn't behave the same. And I'd far rather put you know a split shot up from the fly, say 18, 24 inches up, up from the fly uh, and, and use that weight to get the fly down or better yet, Put a little sink tip on the end of my fly line to, to, to get that fly down to where the fish are. Uh, just just kind of my personal preference. Um, I fish these a lot towards dark and without any weight on just a regular floating line, this guy, it'll, it'll swing down and across unless the current's really flying. It's, it's about two to three inches below the water. And towards dark, when fish start really, really looking up, um, 
I, I have huge success with it, totally unweighted. Works like a charm. Let me see. Uh, I wanted to ask to my kit, but save a little coin. Which is more versatile, wider strips or narrow? Uh, I Scott, this is for Scott about the uh, which strips are wider or narrower. Um, uh, I, I prefer the the narrowest strips possible, honestly. Uh, the wider, it just seems to be more cumbersome, uh, more leather that you've got to deal with in terms of tie-in, in terms of it getting saturated with water. Uh, so I really do like the thin stuff. Um, what else do we got in terms of questions? All good. Um, anyway, let me, uh, I'm going to get the fly finished off. Another thing I, you can see here, guys, I have my, my thread pretty much flossed out. Gosh, that pine squirrel looks good. Doesn't it, Abby? So with it flossed out like that that's kind of what you want if you if you go to whip finish and your thread is too corded up um and and you you get your whip finish done and you're pulling the thread underneath the wraps a lot of times it'll turn into a knot and and break your tying thread at the very last step so just as a, as a matter of habit i just give my bobbin a, a light little counterclockwise spin uh right before i whip finish Okay, um, where am I looking, Joan? I'm sorry. Do you find that when you spin the tying thread, it creates a situation that cuts your materials, i.e. peacock curl and metal? Uh, yeah, this is a question from Clinton about spinning the thread too much. Yes, it can cut materials. Um, I don't really have it happening with peacock curl so much, but if you have like strong thread that's really spun up, um, it, it will cut through things like deer hair. Like if you were making, or elk hair, like an elk hair caddis or something like that, and you have your thread really corded up, uh, you can actually cut the hair with that. Uh, Paul Russo, what's the smallest you'd tie fish this? About a 12, Paul. That's, um, it just, you know, a 14 is okay, but it just doesn't kind of lay out well with the size of the size of the pine squirrel. Um, and you know you're you're down to small hackles and things like that on, on the 14. Um, someone said micro mink works well. Micro mink is is really cool stuff. It's a, it's a little hard to find in the the really good thin um, uh, zonker strips. That's the only thing that I that I've found. Um, let's see else. Um, somebody asked if this uh, will post on YouTube at some point. There's a complete tying video that I did years ago um, on this fly, the squirrel and hurl bugger, um, and you can access it on my YouTube channel. Uh, it's got um, actually a, a bit more information and and really really up close video of what what I'm doing. Um, uh, yes, and this, uh, uh, my wife Joan is reminding me, this will be up on Fly Tire, um, uh, I think fairly shortly after this video is done. Uh, Ed Janiga, um, uh, your pine squirrel has a twist. Uh, there really isn't, I have a couple of those strands as well. Uh, there isn't a whole lot you can do about it. I save those twisted ones and um, uh, use them for... Uh, like legs, I don't know whether you guys saw it or not, but I did a video, uh, it was called the um, the Fat and Funky Pheasant Tail. And what it did is use pine squirrel that's put into a, a dubbing loop and spun up for legs. Um, yeah, if it's, if, if it's the, um, if it's the leather that, that's the the thing that's not straight that's got the twist in it so something else you can do with it it does because of the fine markings on it when you spin it up in a dubbing loop or even split thread it looks so good look to me it looks way more like legs than just about anything else uh that you can use it's a little extra effort to do um you know you you, you could use um wood duck or uh, Hungarian partridge to get those good markings for legs or a little hen hackle, but um, 
to me, that, that spun up pine squirrel just looks phenomenal. Uh, have you ever considered or try to tie a bead or a cone head? I, I have. I put, Paul, I put bead heads and cone heads on this fly and on woolly buggers. And again, I, I keep on coming back to it. Yeah, it's convenient to have that weight on there. You just tie the fly on and chuck it out there. It gets down. But I just, I have so much luck with weightless streamers um, that, that are towed behind, like I said, a, a, a little split shot about 18 inches up or, or, uh, using a sink tip. Um, and uh, for me, I, I think that that motion just looks so much more natural when, when it's weightless in the water. Anyway, I'm going to go and, and uh, get this. If you have if you have fibers sticking out before you whip finish, just a little moisture on your fingertips. Just get that stuff preened back. It goes a long, long way. It doesn't last forever, but It'll keep it back long enough. So I have my thread fairly uncorded. And I like when I'm whip finishing from back to front if I can. And so four or five turn whip finish. And then real important, guys, is to seat that knot well. Your whip finish is only as good as how much you seat it. And then keep a little tension on it. I'm using a a little chisel on my whip finish tool to uh cut the thread but that way that that um that thread you know the end of the thread kind of goes back underneath the the uh the the thread wraps and sort of disappears i think i got one little nasty under there get that out um Chip, who tuned in late, um, it's the the hook is it's um, a Lightning Strike SN3 in size 10, uh, or a Dairiki number 710 in size 10. Any any 3x long uh, kind of nymph hook or nymph streamer hook will will work just fine. And the recipe will be up on the Fly Tire uh, website as well. And so what I'm going to do just to finish this fly off, guys, um, and then I'll, I'll continue to ask answer questions as long as you guys keep on asking them. Um, I'm, I'm going to use, going to zoom out. This is just Sally Hansen hard as nails in here. Uh, about the best $2.50 you'll ever spend is on one of these applicator bottles. This one's from Wopsy. Uh, for me, it keeps Sally Hansen viable almost indefinitely. You can see how nice and loose it is in there. Uh, a little needle goes in. Uh-oh. Drop the little needle. Give me a second, guys. Got to get that out. Anyway, the little needle is the hardest thing to get back in there. But... Not really easy to do with a big camera there. Anyway, that little needle just absolutely makes it airtight, keeps it super, super viable. But just ha just the ability to just get a single drop out of the end, just a gentle squeeze, and kind of wrap it around. Uh, it, it's worth its weight in gold. I think they are like $2.50. Um, and that way you're not unscrewing the, you know, the lid of head cement or doing, doing anything crazy like that. And so we'll just let that, that, uh, that head cement sink in and, and, um, and dry for a while. And that's, that's the squirrel and hurl bugger. Again, it, for me, it's, it's all but replaced my woolly bugger, kind of the same function, just a general all around streamer. I think it has more motion than a woolly bugger, and uh, I, I think the dark markings also on the pine squirrel um, really really make a difference. Question. question: Sally Hansen, yes, Sally Hansen's. Do I ever trim the hackle fibers? Um, no. First of all, Tom, no, never trim the hackle fibers. It, it, it's 
you know, you want to keep those hackle points, those natural points looking natural. If you trim them off, it just looks kind of truncated and, and kind of weird. And I do, I, you know, I, I like, I said it earlier, I like on my woolly buggers and on these uh, streamers like this, I like that, that those, you know, the longest fibers to be about a full hook shank in length. So from back edge of the hook eye to the start of the bend, um, that's to me, that's what I'm looking for. And when I'm, when I'm tying these, you know, tying dozens of them say, um, I'm, I'm actually measuring, um, each time, um, to just to, to make sure that the, there's consistency, uh, between flies. Uh, question from Seth, do you tie this in other colorways? Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, the, uh, it can be tied in a whole bunch of different colors. Pine squirrel, let me see what I got here. Um, just to show you guys, pine squirrel is available in a whole bunch of different colors. Uh, you can even get barred stuff, which looks really cool. It's a crawdad. Um, my favorite is sculpin olive, which I was just tying with. Um, you know, some variability in the colors, but things like chartreuse, absolutely awesome. Um, and, you know, you, you kind of take uh, your, your hackle, make your hackle match. So a more chartreuse rather than an olive uh, hackle that you wind around there. Dark brown, real good looking color. Um, and, you, I mean, you can get super funky with it. Um, that one's red. Um, really don't use that a whole lot. But, um, yeah, it comes in just about every color of the rainbow. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, so does the, um, so does the hackle. You can get, uh, bugger packs and, um, these saddle hackle packs from Ewing, uh, in just about any color of the rainbow. Um, thank you, Steve. I think it's a beautiful fly as well. Uh, really, really like it. And, um, had, I, I guess I started tying it probably six or seven years ago now. Um, I, I think that's how old that video is. It's up on up on YouTube, um, and uh, never never looked back. Um, just just has always worked for me. Any other questions, guys? I don't think I. Oh, okay. Um, one of the questions is how I fish it. Like I said, I, I like to fish it near the surface. Uh, that's just me, but I, I do fish it down and across. And so, um, you know, looking three quarters downstream, uh, across, and I may chuck an upstream mend in right after the cast, just to let things sink just a little bit. Um, I, I do like just a very, very natural swing across. Um, if I can, I might bump the rod a couple of times, just pulse the rod as it's swinging through. Um, and I generally don't start to strip under most conditions, start to strip line in and pull the fly in until it's almost all the way down on the dangle. Um, and then I'll just very, very small strips. I, I, I don't really like long strips so much, uh, but I, I do get a lot of takes on this particularly towards dark and after dark, as soon as it comes in on the dangle, in other words, straight downstream, and then just a couple little strips, and that's usually when it gets absolutely waffled. Um, yeah, you, you have to be careful there, though, um, and, you know, have pretty good uh, with this uh, 4X, maybe 5X, but because if you get that take when it's straight downstream and your rod tips low, there's no shock absorption anywhere. Uh, and, and a lot, a big fish will bust that off. Um, so um, that's generally how I fish it. And John Ledger has a question. John Ledger, what's the name of the glue bottle again? Uh, John, it's just, it's called a head cement applicator bottle, I think, uh, for for the glue bottle. And yeah, I, I've been using it for a number of years and, and just absolutely love the things. I have a uh, bottle of um, Sally Hansen somewhere on my shelf that that's um, I kind of was doing a 
little with it. Um, the, the Sally Hansen in there is almost two years old. It's definitely thickened up, but it's, it's still moving around in the, in the bottle. Um, Okay, do do I prefer using split shot or a sink tip line for fishing this? Um, I'm kind of a sink tip guy. I, I've I've it's taken a while for me to come around to that. Uh, I, I split shot. I I always have, so it's very convenient. But a couple years ago, I started doing the trout spay stuff, um, single hand spay and uh, light two handed spay, uh, like three and four weight trout spay rods. And with trout spay, you're a lot of times you're working with different tips, okay? And so I got used to using different tips and trading tips in and out, and and so I can really fine tune how deep the, I'm pulling the fly using different tips. So I, I guess I'd say the the tip sink tips uh, more more than the lead at this point. Lead's just easy though. Uh, and Carrick, <laughs> this is a, uh, <laughs> it's a pine squirrel streamer. Uh, it's, it's actually called a squirrel and hurl bugger. And, um, uh, our son drew, uh, <laughs> said that it sounds like something he used to do in college. He'd, uh, he'd run away and then puke. Um, but I never really, when I, called it that it's just it's the mater two materials that are basically the two materials that are in the fly uh squirrel pine squirrel to be exact uh and hurl peacock hurl any other questions guys because uh, i'm just about running out of time here but i thank you all very much for for tuning in tonight i i hope it was okay i hope you'll come back and watch more of these um uh i'll be back the week after next on thursday april 23rd uh in the meantime uh next tuesday gunner brammer uh is going to be tying one of his streamer patterns if you haven't seen his streamer patterns you you really need to tune in uh he's on youtube a lot uh an amazing tire, really and truly uh, that will be on fly tires instagram page um if you guys have any suggestions of flies that you want to tie uh, you can post them on my Facebook page or on my tire, whatever you want to do. Uh, just, you know, nothing too wild. I uh, got five minutes to get through all these or uh, through a fly and or or maybe two if they're smaller flies. So uh, keep it easy. Um, also, be sure to check fly tire, F L Y T Y E R dot com for more live on the vice live events, uh, recipes so you can tie along if you want to. Um, and they're also uh, hopefully doing upcoming of it online classes, which should be really cool. Um, again, thanks everybody for tuning in. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, hopefully, we'll see you on the water sometime soon. I don't know when that's going to be, but uh, stay healthy and well, everybody. See you soon. <laughs>